everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. I'm Suyun Shin, a clinical research scientist in the digital biomarkers team at Verily. Max Burke, our lead data scientist, and myself will share some scientific updates based on StudyWatch data today. Next slide. Our goal is to identify molecular or sensor-based biomarkers that correlate with Parkinson's disease severity or disease progression. So far, we have been working on identifying sensor-based digital biomarkers to capture various aspects of motor function based on data provided by you. There are many uh, types of data elements, and one of the essential elements for the work is the data come from uh, StudyWatch. Next slide. We cannot thank you enough for your continued, truly outstanding commitment to provide very valuable sensor data. Many of you were the study watch for most of the day, every day, for three years. This degree of commitment is truly unprecedented in the field of clinical research using wearable devices. We thank you so, so much. Also, we cannot miss the opportunity to thank you for your commitment for the weekly skill check. Again, truly remarkable commitment, and we are very happy to share that your valuable skill check data enabled an impactful advance in the field. Max will share the scientific results about that with you. Hi everyone, I'm Max Berg, and um, if I recall last year at this uh, same participant event, we had shared some exciting ongoing work, uh, which at the time we were start only starting to uh, look at the VME and the virtual exam data. And I'm really happy to share um, that uh, that work has led to a successful publication earlier this year in Nature Digital Medicine. And this has uh, really been kind of tremendously uh, well, well received by the scientific community. Uh, we've had Twitter and, and messages and newspaper articles about our, our work really showing how impactful this will be for the field. And I, I can't thank you enough for providing the data that made this uh, possible. Now, I want to share a little bit more detail, um, and, and you can always go and read the paper yourselves. It's, uh, it's available online for anybody to read. But just at a high level, really what we did is looking at those skill check tasks and trying to understand how they relate to uh, the in-clinic UPRS exams that you, that you undergo when you visit. And so, for example, for Tremor here, uh, we looked at two tasks, the seated rest, with your hands on your lap, which is supposed to elicit some rest tremor, as well as the arm raise task, which is supposed to elicit some postural tremor. And both of, both of those tasks, what we looked at is the signal that comes from the study watch. And so here in blue, I've plotted those acceleration signals. And as you can see on the top row, there's very, very little movement happening. And that is consistent with the idea that this is rated as a zero or no tremor by the assessor as well as by the two independent raters who looked at the video to confirm the assessment. And as you go down from the first row to the second to the third, you can see that the amount of movement increases and it becomes very marked uh, on the bottommost row with a lot of tremor, uh, which is rated as a three on the UPRS scale. And so what this shows, and we do a lot more analysis in the paper, is really to show how we're able to accurately capture the symptoms in the clinic, in the home setting, sorry, in the VME, um, and allows this to kind of really perform a more accurate picture and a more consistent and, and uh, measurement that is every week, every time you take the measurement, rather than just once a year when you go into the clinic. This is another example for the arm twist task of the VME. And as you, as you know, this arm twist is, is measuring your ability to really perform this voluntary movement as quickly and as rapid as uh, widely as possible. And as you can see here, the opposite of what happened with tremor is, is visible here, where on the top row, for people who do not have signs of bradykinesia, 
the movement is wide and has a lar large amplitude and is very regular, which is kind of symptomatic of, of somebody who can do the armless movement uh, as, as, as healthily as possible. And as you go down to the second and the third row, you can see that the amplitude becomes lower and there's less and less movement uh, visible, as well as the frequency also becomes slower. So there are the, the periodicity of the movement becomes a little bit slower. And finally, the third task that we look investigate in the paper is this up and wheel task. And the idea is really to measure the swing of the arm during walking. And as you can know, this what arm swing is, is a, a capital critical symptom for, for Parkinson's disease. And you can see in the graph here that we're able to measure that as well. And at the top row, uh, large amounts of arm swing show kind of translate to very little or no walking impairment. And all the way at the bottom with people who have severe uh, walking impairment, the, the amount of energy and, and movement that we can measure in the study watch is much lower. The interesting thing that we found that we did not expect in the study is really how much variability there is in the different symptoms in the home. So here we're looking at this arm swing measure again, and we can see that there's these blue bars here in this graph correspond to the range of symptoms uh, that, that you can have. And on the x-axis, you have different participants. So each blue bar corresponds to one participant and one of you. And you can see the top and the bottom of the bar correspond to the different range of symptoms that this participant ex uh, experienced during this 90-day period. And so if the bar is very long, that means there was a wide range of different symptoms throughout that period. If the bar is very short, that means all of the symptoms week after week were very consistent. And you can see there's a lot of variability. Some of you experience the symptoms in a very consistent pattern, and some of you experience a much wider range uh, than others. What's interesting, though, is the orange dot here. And, and the orange dot corresponds to the measurement when it was performed in the clinic. And interestingly, it doesn't always map back to uh, the range of measurements that were taken in the home. So this kind of signifies that in some cases, it's very possible that the measurements in the, in the clinic are not representative of how you are faring in the home. And that is also very interesting in terms of figuring out how to better care and how to better understand the, the, the symptom severity and the, the different signs of the disease. Now, in addition to this paper, which we successfully uh, submitted a few months ago, we are not stopping there. And so uh, we're also continuing our work and trying to expand the types of measurements that we can gather from the study watch. And in, in addition to what we can measure from the VME, which I've discussed before, we're also trying to understand what we can measure from outside the VME from just continuous work, because as Suyun said, we have, you have been so engaged with the we're in the device all of the time. This is really helpful. And this allows us to measure a lot of signs and of the disease outside of the, of the VME as well. And so here, this, these are very preliminary results that we're currently still under active development. So on the left, we, we are looking at physical activity and we have different potential markers of, of Parkinson's disease progression. And so on, on this graph, going all, all the way on the way up means worse physical activity symptom signs, and on, going to the bottom means better. And you can see that as the months from enrollment increase from three to six to 12, the blue bars start getting worse and worse. So they, it means the signs of physical activity are increasing in severity. On the other hand, we looked at a, a, a set of matched people who did not have Parkinson's but had the same demographic characteristics of gender and age. And we can see that for those people, the signs of physical activity are not getting worse. And so this is also one way to identify signs that would be able to measure um, the disease progression over the course of a few months instead of years like has been done uh, previously in, and, and is still currently being done. So we're really trying to measure a very fine-grained and sensitive uh, understanding of the physical activity in the home setting. And on the right side, you can see that we're doing the same for tremor. But here, we're not just looking kind of up over the course of two years for, with month from enrollment. We're just trying to see what is the variability of the tremor day after day 
uh, in the home. And, and each color here corresponds to a different uh, UPR score. So all the way at the top, the dark blue means a score of four, which is very severe tremor impairment. And all the way at the bottom, the purple means a score of zero, which means very little tremor. And you can see that even within those groups, there is some fluctuation and some variability. Um, so it's not just enough to know how we are performing or how your tremor, how severe your tremor is on any given day, which as you probably, you probably know better than I, uh, but this is interesting to see that in aggregate in the data, how much, uh, uh, how, how present this variability is. And with that, I will hand it back over to Suyun. Thank you, Max. Some of you are aware that we've submitted an application to qualify skill check based measurement for FDA's drug development tool, clinical outcome assessment pathway. And we've received not accepted determination from FDA last year. We would like to share some updates on this with you today. So, so far, there's no digital measurement qualified for the regulatory pathway by FDA. And still, there are many uncertainties and discussions on the best processes. After the determination, as the one of the first people who went through the process, we've been invited and involved in many discussions where patients, clinicians, pharma, and regulatory agencies got together to move the field forward to incorporate patient-centric digital measures to be part of endpoints in the clinical trials of drugs. At many different levels, now we are working on the process and make, try to make the process more streamlined. One key learning was that uh, we really need to focus on identifying what really matters to patients in daily lives. And we can do this work alone. So now we are working tightly with larger community of researchers, including ones at Redbound, to do the work and focusing on our effort to develop digital measurements that can truly reflect your meaningful aspect of health, such as the ones that Max showed briefly based on daily sensor data. So we are really hoping that we can share some more good news from the journey next year at the event. So next slide. So lastly, here's our team at Verily. As a team, we are so grateful and we thank you for your generosity and commitment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ja, en vanaf deze plaats wil ik ook Verily bedanken voor uh, ja, deze interessante onderzoeksresultaten. En we kijken natuurlijk uit naar de resultaten van volgend jaar. Um, we gaan nu verder met een presentatie ook over het onderzoekshorloge. In het programma zou dat die, uh, stond dat die gegeven zou worden door Luc Evers, maar die zal vervangen worden door Bas Bloem. Maar ik wil wel graag een hartelijk applaus ook voor Luc, um, die heel veel hard werk uh, voor dit onderzoek heeft verricht.